Good afternoon. My name is Paul McDonald, and I'm the Park Superintendent here in the Phoenix Park. Today's talk forms part of the Phoenix Park Biodiversity Festival. For further details and a full list of all of the events available, please go to www.phoenixpark.ie. Today I introduce Margaret Gormley, who is the Chief Park Superintendent with the Office of Public Works. Margaret is responsible for the historic garden conservation, management and presentation over a wide portfolio of sites, including the Phoenix Park, St Stephen's Green and other sites such as Derry Nan in County Kerry. She has put education and research as one of her core objectives in the site she manages. And this in turn has led to a number of sites being awarded green flag status and the Phoenix Park being awarded a gold medal by the World Urban Parks in 2018. Phoenix Park was on one of only two sites in the world to receive this honor. Her talk today is titled Dublin's Green Lung and Biodiversity Haven, Phoenix Park. With that, I will hand you over to Margaret. Hi, my name is Margaret Gormley. I'm Chief Park Superintendent with the Office of Public Works. And my presentation today is on the Phoenix Park, Dublin's Green Lung and Biodiversity Haven. Now, before we get into the presentation, I suppose we should very much make sure we're all thinking of the same thing when we talk about biodiversity. And there's a definition here, but you know, we know what biodiversity is in a sense, you know, it's you know, from the tiny insects to the tallest trees, but it's everything, you know, it's land, it's marine, it's the aquatic systems, it's all these complexes together. So it's, you know, the diversity within species, between species and the ecosystems. And it's very important when you're evaluating biodiversity that you give an extra value, I suppose, to native species, native habitats. And that's why the Phoenix Park is very, very important because, you know, we have so much of the native flora and fauna within the park. But why is biodiversity, biodiversity so important? And this here, you know, is just a slide I took from the EU a Biodiversity Strategy 2030. And, it, you know, they, they don't pull any punches, you know, with regard to biodiversity. You know, it's essential for life. Our planet and our economy are dependent on biodiversity. We need it for healthy lifestyles to protect and to provide for us. And I think it's very interesting statistic there you can see in the bottom of the slide, you know, over 1 million species are at risk of extinction. And we've lost over 60% of the wild species have dropped in the last 40 years. Like that's a very worrying trend. Now, just jumping straight into the Phoenix Park, as they say, you know, I did say, you know, the green lung of Dublin. And if you see the map here, you can see the Phoenix Park outlined. But you also can see, you know, the blue lung, as we call it, linked then Dublin Bay and linked with the River Liffey up to the Phoenix Park. And you can see the size and scale of the Phoenix Park. You know, it really is a, such an essential open space for the city of Dublin. And a few facts and figures. This will quiz you about this at the end. There'll be a little questionnaire. But the Phoenix Park is 1,752 acres. It's over 500 acres of woodlands. You know, we have a large fallow deer herd here in the park. You know, it ranges from five to 600. And pre-COVID, you know, we would have had over 260 major events here in the Phoenix Park on an annual basis. A lot of pitch matches, you know, Gaelic, hurling, a cricket, a polo, all take place here in the Phoenix Park. And like, again, pre-COVID, you know, we had over 10 million car journeys a year that passed through the Phoenix Park. And the visitor centre, uh, the beautiful Victorian Garden Centre, they would have had in excess of 1.4 million visitors a year. And those numbers actually escalated uh, during COVID because you know, people needed to come somewhere for health and well-being. As I said, the Phoenix Park, you know, is famous for its deer herd. And when we talk about biodiversity, we cannot talk about biodiversity in the Phoenix Park without acknowledging the fact that the Phoenix Park is actually a deer park. And that is a legacy that we've had from 1662, when King Charles II uh, introduced fallow deer into the Phoenix Park. And uh, we've had deer in the Phoenix Park ever since. And the browsing of the deer, you know, the herd has, the numbers have increased and decreased over the years, but they have, you know, in the last 20, 30 years have been in or around five to 600 head of deer. And that's really to do with the carrying capacity of the park. And people often ask, you know, why haven't we got beautiful wildflower meadows up through the middle of the Phoenix Park and that? And the reason is, is for these lovely animals in front of us. 
they they eat they eat everything in front of them they're very particular to flowers but all joking aside you know the fallow the park is a deer park and that is only within the enclosures where the deer can't get access do we have a far richer flora in those areas just to give a little bit of sense of you know the enclosures that I mentioned within the Phoenix Park, you have here you know a the centre there, the Vice Regal Lodge, as it was a uh, current President uh, Higgins is the residence of the President of Ireland. You also had the Under Secretary where Winston Churchill lived as a child. The Chief Secretaries is uh, where the current American Ambassador's residence, and then the Under Secretary and Private Secretary. So they were the main domains, and they were where you know from a biodiversity perspective you know the lands are hugely rich in biodiversity a, a far greater range of species but you can see the scale of the phoenix park and just to give a few overviews you know the phoenix park has over 10,000 trees uh, scattered throughout the phoenix park a lot of different uh, landscapes you know with recreational spaces you can see here the setting for the wellington testimonial the cricket grounds in the rear the different pitches even in the distance a uh, the papal cross a uh, but we have other areas like this a uh, phoenix park wouldn't be well known for its lakes but it has five lakes uh, scattered throughout the phoenix park and the wetlands and the lakes are hugely hugely important from a biodiversity perspective the range of species you know uh, in the margins of these areas uh, is you know multiples of any of the other locations within the phoenix park this is the furry glen and you know, I've mentioned the different locations within the Phoenix Park, and you can see here even on this map, you know, where the blue areas are, you know, the enclosed areas, the green are where there's intensive recreation, and then the yellow and the, I suppose the tanny colour, that's all the other areas that are, you know, highly important from a biodiversity perspective. How does this all break down? 93% of the Phoenix Park is actually made up of habitats for flora and fauna. Lakes, 6% of the park. Roads and buildings only account for 7% of the land mass of the Phoenix Park. That's hugely important. And we mentioned, you know, the grasslands. The grasslands in the Phoenix Park are unique in Dublin. They have been unimproved uh, from, you know, very, very late. The only manure fertilizer they would have got would have been from cattle or deer grazing. So very, very important from the flor floristic point of view. Phoenix Park has 25 different habitats, six different types of woodland, and five types of grasslands, depending on if they're on calcareous soils, the locations of those over glacial till, uh, the woodlands. We have, you know, very small ash woodlands. We've mixed woodlands. We've few coniferous areas. So just a different range of uh, areas within the Phoenix Park. How do we manage the Phoenix Park? They're guided by the management is guided by different studies. You know, we're continuously undertaking research uh, on the birds, the bats, etc. And you know, a lot of this culminated together in the Phoenix Park Conservation Management Plan, which is available on our website. I've only included two documents here. A, we have a tree safety management plan, you know, as well, how do we, man you know, for looking after the management of our trees. People often say, you know, some areas we leave the trees on the ground, other areas, you, you, you know, the timber will be lifted immediately. And that's all to do with the zoning of the park from a conservation a, perspective, where we have formal areas, they would be well manicured, where areas where we're trying to naturalize it, we will actually leave the timber a wood on the ground, we won't cut the grass, we might only cut it once a year. So all different areas have a different regime. And this is tied back in, as I mentioned, to our conservation management plan. And there's a number of objectives in the management plan, you know, it's looking at the historic landscape, the archaeology, the architecture, but from a biodiversity perspective, this is the objective that's key, you know, to conserve the natural plant and animal species, along with their habitats, while improving biodiversity. And we take the motto, you know, do no wrong and to continue to improve where we can. And, you know, just even this images there, you know, you can see on the right hand side, this is part of a, our a grasslands. But this is actually along the North Road in the Phoenix Park. And you'd be surprised, you know, when you actually stop to look, you know, if you're driving past, you just see, you know, oh, there's a bit of grass. But when you look in that, you can see plantain, you can see forget-me-nots, a clover, and a, a, a buttercup as well. So you can see, you know, it just in that small little image, the lake here in Oris, hugely important again for the margins. 
we have six out of 10 uh, of bat species have been recorded in the Phoenix Park. And that's, you know, on some of the old buildings, but also in trees as well. 70, we have over 76 bird species that have been recorded in the Phoenix Park. Uh, four that are on the red list and I think 10 that are on the amber list. Phoenix Park has been, as mentioned, you know, it's a hugely important habitat. And this is our uh, habitat map for the Phoenix Park. And I, you can't see this close up, but, you know, the bright green areas are, you know, the new woodlands. You can see here the yellow. They are the unimproved grasslands. And where you can see here this light green with a stripe in it, they have been improved. So, and you'll actually notice if you're, you know, used to Phoenix Park, that's where the pitches are. And up here would be where the concerts, et cetera. So you can see, you know, the various different areas. Blue here is the water areas and green, dark green here is scattered parkland, woodland trees. So you can see, you know, the range of habitats uh, throughout the Phoenix Park. There's been a number of publications on the Phoenix Park the Wild Plants of the Phoenix Park, a hugely important publication, and we're looking at a uh, with the authors of that or a uh, with the Dublin Naturalist Field Club uh, to actually do an updated version. A, a number of rare species have been recorded in the park: park the hairy butter, or hairy a uh, violet, a uh, the hairy a uh, hypericum, and also a uh, the bar shaking barley. Grassland management is hugely important in the Phoenix Park, and we try to take a, you know, the, we have, I suppose, over the last 20, 30 years, hay has been taken off the Phoenix Park, and the objective of this is actually to take the nutrients out of the grass to increase the floral uh, mix within the park, and you'll see you know, we don't cut the hay, or cut the grass until the end of the summer to try and leave it uh, as long as possible for ground nesting birds uh, and then trying to take the hay off uh, later, you know, in the end of August, early uh, September, which can be problematic because it's very difficult to try and get somebody to do it at this time of year. Uh, and sometimes we do succeed and sometimes we don't. Uh, we're all very familiar with the pollinator plan and you know their strategy and don't mow let it grow and i suppose you know while these are novel ideas and you know in the last couple of years the team in the phoenix park have been you know practicing these policies for over 20 years and i suppose we we actually always called it political mowing you know where we you know we mowed the strips along the edge but inside of that the grass the grass was let grow and you know, we just take a crop off, as I mentioned earlier, once a year. But these are the types of species you know, that you can get in these areas. And if you're not able to you know, leave your grass for the whole year, you know, even if you only cut it once every six weeks, you're really increasing uh, the floristic value in that. And then the benefits you know, from insects, from butterflies, from pollinators, et cetera. And this is just a sample. And I want to thank uh, Una Fitzpatrick from the National Biodiversity Center for this particular slide. As I mentioned earlier, deer, you know, Phoenix Park from a biodiversity point of view, you know, it is a deer park and the management of the fallow deer is hugely important uh, for us. And we have a number of uh, principles that we work to uh, for the management of a herd. It's quite unique. You know, they are wild deer, yet they're only, you know, less than two miles from Dublin city centre. And, you know, they can technically walk in and out the gates if they want. Very rarely do they leave the Phoenix Park. But we look at it from a number of different perspectives. We look at the deer population, you know, their density, the genetics, their health, uh, how we go about culling it. You know, the ecological value of the deer, you know, uh, you know with deer grazing, the particular plant species that they will graze on more and others that they won't. And how does that impact the overall floristic value of the uh, grasslands? We look at the welfare of the deer and the welfare of, uh, you know, the, they actually have refuges within the Phoenix Park, you know, where we do let, you know, the nettles, etc., grow brambles, grow longer, and they will actually feel more comfortable in those areas when they're uh, fawning, etc. We also look at public safety, you know, with regard to, we have traffic here, you know, you can see this here is a cycling event and uh, one of the stags decided to jump across one of the, one of the cyclists. And what was quite interesting afterwards, we got a, a number of phone calls to see how the deer was. Nobody asked us how the poor cyclist was, but uh, we do know he came second in the race. So he obviously recovered fairly quickly. We work with University College Dublin uh, on the program, uh, on the welfare of the deer, the genetics uh, and how we manage them. Uh, we're always looking for a healthy population, how we look after the historic landscape. 
what else kind of, of the browsing levels within the park, the impact they have on other flora, and then everything is done as safe as possible. We actually are undertaking a three year program at the moment to do with people, the public feeding the deer. Like, you know, deer are not meant to be fed, a, you know, they're a foraging animal, and it has a significant impact on their welfare. And, you know, these here are just studies over one year, and, you know, there's over 16,000 interactions between the deer and the public, you know, and we're very, very lucky that no member of the public has been seriously injured by a deer. Like the deer are actually going now looking for food. And it's very, very important that the public don't go within 50 meters of the deer and do not feed the deer. They're not actually helping the deer. A lot of mammals have been recorded in the Phoenix Park. I'm not going to go through them all, but just to say 15 out of 25 of the terrestrial mammals have been recorded. You know, the badger, the wolves, we have over 20 badger sets throughout the park. We have foxes, house mice, you know, wood mice, European rabbits, a rat, a grey squirrel. We've had a programme to eradicate a, the squirrel as well because of a, the, the invasive nature of them and the damage they do to the trees. A, we have number of dragonflies. Uh, one of our guides in the visitor centre is very keen on citizen science and spends a good bit of time recording butterflies and dragonflies and sending all that information to the National Biodiversity Data Centre. You know, we even work with different societies in the Phoenix Park this year was, you know, with, uh, to do with the frogs uh, and tadpoles uh, in the Phoenix Park was very important. We were clearing out some drains and we had done some damage to this area. And we worked then with the society to actually uh, restore the area and to make it a favourable habitat. And you can see here the end result, which I think everyone was pleased with. I mentioned there's over 10,000 trees in the Phoenix Park. And trees are hugely important uh, within the Phoenix Park and for our landscape. I mean, the huge, huge benefits, you know, from a country as a whole and from the whole world in that, you know, they uh, absorb energy, you know, removal of pollutants, intercepts store, uh, rainwater. And, you know, Ireland has only 11% land cover in trees. And if you look at the EU average of 36, you know, we've a long, long way to go. Phoenix Park has a lot of mature trees. We've over over 10,000 trees. We have a program of replanting trees. However, you know, it is hard to get trees established, you know, to get plenty of space for them. And, you know, the species that we plant now, we have to be very, very careful. You know, climate change is having an impact. We're having hotter summers and we're having rainfall in very sudden downpours. And with the change in temperature, you know, we are getting more tree diseases coming our way. You know, there's lovely uh, stands of oak trees in the Phoenix Park. But if you look across to London uh, and uh, around England, they have oak processionary moth. So we have to be very careful in the species we plant that, you know, we don't bring in any diseases and that what we do plant will re be resilient to the impacts of climate change over the next hundred years. An oak tree can sustain over 280 different species. So you can see how important these are uh, from a habitat a point of view. A, also bird nesting, bats, etc. Biodiversity in the Phoenix Park is very, very important, and I suppose no more important than with the President of Ireland. And President Higgins did ask me a, if we would undertake a biodiversity audit a, within the grounds of Auris Nuxon. It's over 100 acres. And along with a Trinity College Dublin, Professor Jane Stout, a, who coordinated a, a study with us on uh, the Auris grounds. And, you know, some very interesting findings. You'll get the full report on our website and on the president's website. 14 distinct habitats and 80% of the area within the Auris is considered biodiversity friendly. And of the balance of the 20%, a considerable amount of that is actually uh, ornamental horticulture, which would be some uh, would go a long way to be by very uh, biodiversity rich, but wouldn't be considered a natural biodiversity habitat. The report contains a number of recommendations, you know, for short and long term management actions to improve biodiversity. And one of the examples uh, in that is we are actually introducing a a native Irish breed of cattle a, in the next month into the grounds of Auris Neutron a, as part of the a, foraging and how we're going to a, improve the sward a, within a, the grounds. So all the time looking at how we can improve it and how we can do it as sustainable as possible. Now, as part of that study, over 805 species were identified. 
And, you know, in the Phoenix Park as a whole, we've over 307 species of plants. And in Oris, we got 297. And I'm sure we probably would have uh, got more only if this was undertaken during COVID. So it did limit uh, at different times, you know, what surveying could be undertaken. Just to give you an idea of the grounds of Oris Nuktron, the front of the house, uh, some formal areas here behind the house, the parterres, and then, you know, the different grassland areas. And this here is the area here is where the cattle are going to be introduced uh, for a grazing regime. We've actually taken a, a lot of the grass off that and have some, done some green uh, seed sowing from another area here to try and improve uh, the floral mix within this area. You can see here just at the bottom of the slide, the ornamental flower gardens. But even within those areas, you know, we will be very selective in what we plant. We'll always try to put in single species flowers because they're far uh, more potential for biodiversity and pollinators. This was some of the team who worked uh, on the biodiversity audit in Oris. And you can see Dr. Paul Dowding there and John Rochford uh, from Trinity. And a huge range of people were involved in that study. And uh, very, very uh, interesting and worth having a look through it. So what does OPW do in the Phoenix Park to try and make it as biodiversity sensitive as possible? You know, we look at how we manage our grasslands. You know, it's not just a matter of going out and cutting them, you know, daily or weekly. You know, we look at where we cut them, when we cut them, and even the type of machinery do we put on. You know, we're all the time, we don't want to compact the soil. We want to try and, you know, minimise the impact as much as possible. Our tree management systems are very sensitive to biodiversity. We'll, we'll survey trees for habitats before we'll actually uh, remove a tree in the Phoenix Park. And then how we remove it, we will look at a particular zones you know obviously public safety is a priority for us but if we can leave the timber on the ground we will actually leave it on the ground and let it decompose and you know that will be habitats for hundreds of different microorganisms things like the light levels in the phoenix park you know this coming quite topical now you know a light pollution and the impact that it'll have on insects and on a uh, moths etc and the phoenix park a, my predecessor, Dr. John McCullen, was very, very keen from a heritage point of view that the original gas lights and gas lighting system would be maintained in the Phoenix Park. And, you know, we've really come full circle now. You know, the gas lights are actually quite low light level that provide sufficient lighting for those who need to be here. But yet it has minimised the impact on the flora and fauna on the Phoenix Park. Chemicals, you know, fertilisers. You know, we do not fertilize any grasslands in the Phoenix Park. Uh, we don't, we haven't done for a long, long time. Fertilizers, we very, very rarely would put fertilizers out. And that would only be, you know, in locations where we would be doing crop production, say for a uh, visiting heads of state and that, and we would use organic fertilizers, uh, seaweed fertilizers, etc. So everything we do, we're looking at, you know, what is sensitive. Even, you know, where the, the areas where the public go, we're very conscious, you know, we will not let groups, you know, if we've large organised events into certain areas, we don't let people do cross country runs uh, through the Forry Glen, because that's a biodiversity rich habitat. And the last thing we want is, you know, 500 runners in mucky boots uh, running up down through the banks there and in, interfering with the habitats. We will try and encourage as many groups to run on the roads, which, you know, where they'll have minimal impact on the setting of the park and allow, you know, all the different layers of the Phoenix Park to work uh, together. And, you know, where we have uh, let the grass grow long uh, throughout the park, you know, some people may say, oh, well, the public can't use those areas, particularly in the last two years with COVID, you know, the public need more space to spread out. And we've mown loads of paths through different uh, grassland areas to facilitate the public to be able to get in, to pass through those areas, but at the same time to leave plenty of areas for ground nesting birds, which are important. Uh, things like weed control, you know, we mentioned, you know, we don't use chemicals. Like we've been bringing in road sweepers in the Phoenix Park for over 20 years. And they go along all the curbs, sweep it up, don't allow any weeds to germinate. So we don't have to spray those areas. And this is, you know, when we mentioned about mechanical means, you know, we're looking at foam, we're looking at a uh, hot water, these different processes uh, to where we have to control weeds. We try to leave weeds where we can. You know, as I say, you know, a weed is the wrong plant in the wrong place. It could be the right plant in a different place. So we, we 
very, very carefully are selective in how we manage these areas. A, you know, from a biodiversity point of view, you know, we produce a lot of plants in uh, the Phoenix Park with a kitchen, two kitchen gardens, one in the Auris and one at the Phoenix Park Visitor Centre. Uh, the gardens within the Auris, uh, all the food there is used to supply the house and any visitors uh, that the president would be, be entertaining on behalf of the state. We have organic status. We've had it for over 10 years there in how we manage those gardens. Over two he hectares are managed organically. That's very important, you know, from a biodiversity point of view. So, you know, there is no chemicals. Uh, it's a very, very sustainable method. Uh, we even have hens there, you know, so even the eggs are all collected. You know, they go up to the house. There's very few air miles. So we're looking at all the time. How can we, you know, produce everything, you know, as sensitively and as sustainable as possible? A, where we have ornamental horticulture, you know, some people, you know, there might be a little bit of a tension there with that regard to biodiversity, but it is very, very easy to make it all very compatible. A, we plant a heritage varieties of apples, for example. We've over 65 different Irish apple varieties now growing in the orchards at Aris Nuktron. So that's really improving their biodiversity because you're uh, spreading the gene, a pool for uh, apple varieties, minimizing disease, and at the same time, you know, improving uh, the selection and the heritage uh, and the pollination of the varieties we have there. As I mentioned before, when we do a lot of planting, you know, we're always conscious. Our gardening teams are hugely uh, proactive uh, from a pollinator, from a biodiversity perspective. And they are the ones who lead the way, you know, in making sure what we do is as sensitive po as possible. You know, we'll have bee hotels and insect hotels dotted around the place. You know, if they get, you know, a whole load of little twigs, they'll tie them together and drop them in different locations. And this is all just done as part of you know, the course just to improve everything for biodiversity. We don't fill every crack in the walls, you know, they're habitats as well. Not everything is pristine. And I think, you know, we've had to move from a location where everything was manicured and spotless to an area now where you, you have certain areas that are somewhat manicured and the rest then is really from an, managed from an environmental perspective. We have over 20 beehives scattered throughout the Phoenix Park, all in a a remote locations where the public don't have access. But again, this is all for pollination, uh, to improve pollination of the various species within the Phoenix Park. And I know our bee beekeepers have won awards here in Ireland and in England uh, with the honey production here in the Phoenix Park. With all the practices that we have, you know, it's very important that you keep up to date with research. And we link, you know, we've a uh, link with University College Dublin, with Trinity College, and you know various different projects a uh, you know from tree diseases to bees you know to the deer we're all the time you know any research we will uh, engage with those individuals and sometimes some locations we've commissioned research to improve our knowledge to try and present the phoenix park as best we can a uh, and you know with reductions, you know, we've done a transport mobility study there over the summer for the Phoenix Park. And, you know, you're trying to balance, you know, it is within, you know, a city, you know, a, over a million of a population. We have over 500,000 people that live within five kilometres of the Phoenix Park. You know, so that's a huge amount of people that we need to cater for who you know, could consider this their local park. It's also a national park, you know, uh, for people all over Ireland who come to the Phoenix Park to see the park or they might be coming to Dublin Zoo. It's very, very important. So we have to manage uh, the traffic numbers uh, in the Phoenix Park to be able to support the biodiversity. And as I mentioned, you know, the Phoenix Park works on a number of different levels and it's a balance to try and, be, you know, we can't go 100 percent to biodiversity because that will have an impact on something else. But we try to manage all the different layers where there is a net and to achieve a net gain in all the different areas. Just some images here to show the different grassland management. This here is in the grounds of Auris Nuptron. You can see the willow herb, uh, the yellow rattle here in the background. And you can see, I mentioned, you know, our political mowing, you know, where we'll cut a grass strip at the edge and then we'll let it naturalise behind that. And it means in these areas here, you're only cutting it once a year and you're taking off the nutrition there and very little compaction of the grounds. Uh, again, you know, we've mentioned the deer. You can see the grass here. You can see the mown paths here in the middle. 
uh, you know, these are the areas for the public to pass through, but you can see the deer are taking a walk through them on this occasion. We've, I mentioned ornamental horticulture, you know, this here is the dairy and you can see, you know, the lavender here, a hid coat, it's very good variety, lovely deep color. This would be buzzing the whole time with the bees. And you can see there, you know, even the rose varieties that we will select, we'll be careful, a, you know, that has an open type of flower, a, it's a Dorothy Perkins, I think. I mentioned the heritage Irish apple varieties. This is some of the older varieties. You can see apples collecting. We have apple storehouses here. And these are the apple trays that the apples will be stored in over the winter to be used, you know, for apple tarts, etc. Uh, in the house. And we'll even juice the apples. So you can see here, you know, very little air miles. And, you know, from the, uh, the grounds of the Auras right through to a visiting head of state will be served organic apple juice. I mentioned light pollution and it's very, very important. You know, we come under a lot of pressure to, you know, light the Phoenix Park, you know, and extensively light the Phoenix Park. And we, we resist it, like we say, first and foremost, it is a park. And while the park is available to the public from dawn to dusk, and if they want to come at other times, they're welcome, but that we are not going to flood light the Phoenix Park. And this is one of the early gas lighters. Uh, they're on autopilots now, but, this is part and part of, parcel of the Phoenix Park. And you can even see here where we're, you know, we do light up certain areas. We will actually use minimal lighting and a, this LED light. This is just for St. Patrick's Day, but it is very, very limited a, impact on any of the flora and fauna. And we'll, it'll actually be switched off then when it's not in you, when it's not required. So again, you know, we don't flood light a, buildings per se. We look at, you know, where we plant. This here is in the wall garden at the Phoenix Park Visitor Centre. You can see all the apple varieties. You can see here, you know, we have Nepeta planted. I think it's Nepeta or a uh, Nepeta uh, or marjoram, actually. I think it might be marjoram planted along. Again, you know, single flowering there. That would be great. Uh, it, again, a buzz. You can see even, you know, the plants in behind here. You know, there's some corn. There's different plants there. Uh, to give a plenty of opportunities for pollinators. Some of the crops uh, from the wall garden that are harvested, and you can see the espaliers on the walls behind. Uh, while the gardens here at the wall garden do not have organic status, they are managed for organic to organic principles. So there is no spraying uh, and the public are very welcome. This garden is open 365 days of the year, free of charge, and to go in and talk to the gardeners there and any gardening questions or any tips uh, they're, they're, they are the experts. Uh, you know, we wonder why, you know, we mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, why is biodiversity so important? And it's, a, you know, and I just there just to remind me uh, more so, you know, it supports everything we need to survive for food, clean air, water, raw materials and fertilize and, you know, for stable climates. So, you know, it is hugely important. And if we all can do our little bit, uh, you know, we will leave something for the next generation. And I mentioned, you know, the practices, how we do our work. And this here is a wall garden that we're restoring in the grounds of Horus Nuptron. And you can see here, you know, before the restoration, damaged paths, etc. And this here, when we went in, you, we obviously done our resurfacing of our paths. But we've actually planted lavender here at the edge of the path. And then this here is a wildflower mix. A pollinator mix is one of the longest pollinator double borders in Ireland. A, and that, again, is for pollinators for biodiversity and in time this will become a herbaceous border but at the moment a uh, this is to increase the biodiversity uh, gain within the grounds this is why this was undertaken you can see the poles here and the wires on the back that that's actually for heritage irish apple varieties that we're going to be planting over the next two winters and again you know just to give a, a you know to increase the biodiversity and the gene pool within the gardens I mentioned some of the beehives. Uh, we have a number of beekeepers. Uh, our gardeners are qualified beekeepers. Uh, Brian Quinn, who is one of our gardeners, is very, very keen a uh, beekeeper and looks after bees in a number of locations throughout the park. And you can see here, this here is actually one of the quadrants in the wall garden. Again, it was a mix uh, that Brian specially developed for a uh, given at least eight weeks of floral uh, a benefit in the gardens. Often these wildflower mixes will, 
you know, we'll just flower for four weeks. But Brian added to it to try and get, extend the season as long as possible. And the park has actually won the National Biodiversity Data Centre Biodiversity Award a number of years. And somebody asked me one year, why did we not win it in 2018? And I asked the guys and said they forgot to submit their application form, I think was the answer. So, you know, the, the staff here in the Phoenix Park are, you know, very, very uh, diligent and keen on how the park is managed and how they present it uh, to the best of their ability. And I suppose that leads us into, you know, the training of our staff. We do take biodiversity very, very seriously. And with COVID, it actually gave us an opportunity to do an online conference. A, which we've done for all of OPW staff. It's a very large organization and it catered architects, engineers, administration staff. It just wasn't the gardening staff. It was open to the whole organization. Our minister opened it and their chairman closed it. So this, you know, we look at our own, how we upskill our own staff, our own knowledge. And then we also look at the public, you know, the generations to come. And this here is little eco, a summer camps that we run in the Phoenix Park uh, for children. You can see the little worm hotel in the front. And I just noticed this here's oak trees. I'm sure the parents now are not happy with all the oak trees that arrived home. Maybe if, uh, the following year, I'm sure we picked something that wasn't as big. But it's very, very important to encourage children, you know, at a young age, they're just, you know, just absorb all of this information and it will just become the routine for them. And it's very, very important that we, where we can, our guide, very, very knowledgeable and run a number of classes for school groups and then give uh, talks and walks, encouraging uh, all ages to get immersed in biodiversity. I suppose as us for an organization, you know, what are we doing? You know, we're doing a lot of this on the ground, but we do need to get this embedded into the organization. And uh, the main document that we're working on at the moment is the OPW Corporate Biodiversity Action Strategy 21 to 25. And this is nearing completion. Our conference was part of the process of that embedding it within the organization. You know, and we're looking at five key themes, you know, planning for nature, natural leaders, uh, working with water and wildlife, you know, biodiversity by design and natural knowledge. And these are, you know, we have so many strands within the organization. It's very, very important that we, we look at all aspects of, you know, there's areas that are very keen, very good, and it's considered part of their bread and butter, but we need to make sure that this is equal across the organization. What we're looking to do as well, you know, Phoenix Park is a historic landscape. And we have a number of these historic parks and gardens throughout the country. So we're looking at managing those, you know, in a sustainable biodiversity focused manner going forward. Uh, that is part of the rollout in how we manage our gardens. Uh, like we, we look at biodiversity, we look at the impacts of climate change. We work, you know, with the National Biodiversity Action Plan. We're uh, supporters of the Pollinator Plan, All Ireland Pollinator Plan. You know, a number of our staff work in different areas in work on different expert groups as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the communication about biodiversity is hugely important, you know, throughout our organisation, but also with the public. And activities like this, a series of lectures this week, along with the BioFest bio uh, at the weekend, which would encourage as many as people as possible to book in. You know, it's aimed at all levels. Uh, you know, if you have little knowledge or you have loads of knowledge, uh, it, we have different speakers, different people leading the groups uh, who will be able to answer most of your questions, if not all. Uh, and we would, I would encourage as many people as possible to register for the different events. This is just some of a, uh, you know, the brochures and a, a posters that we've done, these are available for schools and school groups, you know, and it just looks at the habitats <clears throat> of the Phoenix Park, you know, the plants, you know, even the birds, you know, we've 72 different species of birds, you know, all the different aspects of the park and, you know, in a simple way that they, a, the children can understand and get a sense of why it's important. Uh, we've had uh, the biodiversity and honey show here in the Phoenix Park for the last number of years. We couldn't do it last year with the bio blitz and President Higgins actually opened the, the last biodiversity festival in the park. Uh, you have a uh, Professor Jane Stout on the right, a uh, Professor uh, Simone Kuti who looks after our deer and then uh, Juanita Brown who uh, works with us on different aspects of biodiversity. So, you know, we're very, very lucky to have this expert knowledge available to us. 
and yet you know the pub and then for us to be I suppose in the middle in a sense and then to try and communicate it out uh, to the public in the locality and those who come to the park. Uh, as I mentioned the park has won different awards you know for pollination, the green flag award for the last number of years how we manage the park you know uh, in an environmental way. And I'm just going to finish up now. This here is my very last slide and it'll just give you a little overview of the Phoenix Park. And maybe you might just look at it now in a different light and just look at it from a biodiversity perspective. So thank you very much.